Well, hello, good people. I've had a haircut. I thought we'd carry on messing around with the Ford engine today. Since last time, I've locked up the big ends with split pins. I'm just looking at a few things that don't actually appear in the drawings. That's the oil drain back to the pan from the valve chest. That needs a blanking plate on it, which I'll make in due course. And that's the end of the camshaft there. Again, Bernie Petenpole doesn't make any mention of that, nor does he need to really. I think he assumed people had a certain amount of mechanical nous when working through his drawings. And all these holes need to be blocked off. So I'm going to make a plate that goes over that locating lug there, round here, bolts on with some sealant and a gasket. And then I'm just going to put two bolts in there with some sealant on the washer area. That should deal with those. I bolted on the timing gear cover as well. It sits flush with the end of the crankcase here and has a thin cover plate. The original cover plate is this wonderful, enormous piece of cast iron. And Mr. Henry did like his cast iron. In fairness, it's all very nicely done and does seal up well, but it weighs a ton. So that'll have a sheet steel cover instead. When I put the Praga engine together, I concentrated wholly on the engine and then was left with the thorny issue of a propeller at the end. This time I've decided I'm going to start on the propeller now as well, whilst the engine is still in process. There's lots to do here with pipe work and plates and things, which I can sort of pick away at. But I decided I'd get on with the prop and in a few occasional episodes, go through how I made a propeller. Now, I used this book last time, Eric Clutton's book, there were six parts of the last series. It is recognised as a cure for insomnia, and uh, I would recommend anyone watches it. Particularly at two in the morning, you'll be asleep by ten past. For the last propeller, I had this broken Aronka propeller, which I made a pattern from, also using some Praga information that my pal in South Africa sent me as well. So I basically recreated an original Praga propeller using information that I found elsewhere. I don't have a pattern propeller for the Ford. In fact, I'm going to put this one away. And information for the Ford engine will have to be found from manuals. The Flying and Glider manual and various others recommend a 72 inch diameter, 42 inch pitch. And Bernie Petenpole liked extracting about 40 horsepower from the motor at 1600 RPM. It doesn't sound like much in the way of horsepower, but 40 horsepower at 1600 RPM is a very efficient speed to turn a propeller. So instead of having a pattern propeller, we're going to make a pattern using what information we can find from the Flying Glider Manual and other sources. And in the no expenses spared world of my workshop, we have a piece of hardboard. It was the bottom of a drawer. In fact, it was half the bottom of a drawer, which I cut in half. So if we cock the first pattern up, we've got enough for another pattern. In fact, there are two more drawers as well, so we can make far too many patterns. So we've got to start somewhere and logically I think we might as well start at the hub. Now there are two versions of the hub. I'll put some pictures up on the screen but the flying and glider man is slightly contradictory. One version has a piece of model T Ford axle bolted to the end of the crankshaft flange. Now I know where is a model T very near here. In fact the owner hates my guts but I'm far too nice to go around nicking bits of axles in the middle of the night. Bernie offers a second version. The second version uses a pair of steel sandwich plates, one which sits on the end of the crankshaft and the other works as a faceplate as you'd normally have on a propeller. I think I'm going to use that method. So if the sandwich plates are five inch diameter, then the propeller at its widest point on the hub wants to be a gnat's crotchet wider than five inches. So I think I'll go for about five and a quarter. Now half five and a quarter is two and five eighths, unless I'm completely wrong. Two and five eighths from the little mark I've made there. I put my compass in the hole on the marks. A slightly wonky compass. This I've had it for years. I think it's left over from college, and that was thirty something years ago. Like all my fellow kleptomaniacs, I never throw anything away. Yes, it's slightly ever widening, but that'll do. That is a little bit over 
five and a quarter. So that's all right. I said a few minutes ago that I didn't have a pattern and I didn't, but I had to knit back to the house to get something. And when I was in the study, I was just glanced up at the Lang propeller, which I've been using on the Aronka C2, which is 66 inch diameter. So it's six inches shorter than the proposed Ford blade, but it's really nice and it's beautifully necked in here. And I'm not so sure I can't just draw around the blade, move it up and down a bit on the hardboard pattern and get the shape I want without having to do anything clever or hard work. And I do avoid anything that is clever or hard work. So I've just had a measure up and this blade at its widest point is five and a half inches wide. Of course, it's a little bit short. So all I'm doing here is lining up with the mark, the center of the hub. And this is really cheating, but I quite like cheating. I think it's rather fun. Right, let's just move that up a little bit to get it to our 72 inches. And then if I draw around it again, of course, we can end up with a sort of double hump slightly, but that doesn't matter because we can just sort of freehand it out. This is tremendously gash. I thoroughly approve. I hope you do too. Well, I rather like that. Let's just go and put that somewhere safe. I don't want to go and... Actually, what? I'm going to go and put it back in the study. I'll be back in a moment. That has worked remarkably well. I've just sort of drawn in the diameter of the Ford hub to the, to the blade. I suppose I could go and find a, a whippy stick or something. I think I used a piece of ribstock before when I was doing something. See if I can find something. Do some French curves, I suppose, but that's far too clever. That one looks okay. It's just this one here. Actually, I, it'll be a lot easier cutting it with a bandsaw than it is sort of marking out here because one isn't really inclined with a bandsaw to go too far off piste. Just sort of gently keep going. I can always sand it in then. So I'll just draw that one in as well. I'll put a picture up on the screen of a original peat and pole with a probably homemade propeller on it and you'll see the the hub sort of area is quite thin. I suppose it's only 40 horsepower. I'm very pleased with that. That actually works quite well. In fact, it works very well. Well, what do you think, fellas? I think that's okay. Anyway, let's go and cut it out. When I made the Praga propeller, I made a load of clamps and had to sort of mess around making that drilling table and lots of other things. So I'm a little further ahead of the game with this. I also got a bit further ahead of the game yesterday. My younger son, the younger brother of the teenage getaway driver, is learning to drive at the moment. He's got his test in a few weeks time. So he and I drove to the wood yard yesterday and selected some not bad Douglas fir. There's two planks that are really good and the other two are not so good but not bad. This is a ground runner so I'm not going to agonise over it. Anyway we dropped by a mate's house near Oakhampton on the way home last night and he put them through the planar thicknesser for me as well. So they're ready to glue together. 
Before I drill these planks for the corners, I'm going to drill there and there all the way through the full thickness. I'm just deciding which plank I'm going to use where. So I'm going to use the two worst on the outside because apart from the hub area up to 35%, and of course even then lots is cut away, the bottom plank and the top plank basically cease to exist because the blade thins down. So only the centre two planks are really used full length. So with that in mind, I'm going to use these two planks in the centre because they are the best two. So this one here. Now it's got a bit of different colour. Now that might be sap wood, I'm not quite sure. It might be, again, if it was for, a f well, I don't know. I'm sure chaps have used all manner of stuff in the past. But it's a slight difference in colour. And the other half of the plank is the same. I'm going to put that on the other side, just in case there is, I don't want to put it, in case there's a difference in density, I'm sort of, Matt sort of sharing the density out across the prop blade. That one lined up as well. And then leading edges here, by the way, sorry, front of the propeller is, front of the propeller is underneath. So this last plank is going to be the, the rear one. That's got a bit of a blemish on it here. It might've been a bit of a, pitch pocket. Anyway, it doesn't matter because that will disappear. I'm going to put it on the top. And of course, that will all be turned into dust and chippings when the prop is carved out eventually. The main thing at the moment is just to get the thing nice and square. I need to get it square because I don't have a lot of width to play with. With that blade profile on top. These planks are six inches, about 150 mil. And I did that for two reasons. One, they weren't as expensive because when I made the other propeller, I used eight inch wide planks. I needed them because the hub was six and a half inches wide, but there was quite a lot of waste. And also the blank weighed a ton. When you see people making these first world war propellers, you know, people like Elena at Culver Propellers, She's lugging those damn great blanks around. She must be a tough girl because even that Praga propeller made out of eight inch wide planks was heavy. So at least using six inch wide planks is keeping the weight down for manhandling it through the bandsaw. That's all lined up so the clamps can go on. I'm going to start gluing in a moment. I'm not going to talk whilst I'm gluing because I sort of have to get a, a bit of a move on. One of the things I didn't do last time was put glue on both sides of the boards. Now, I read on a, a woodworking forum a few criticisms of tight bond glue, not all of them to do with how it glues. In fact, a lot of them weren't. They were about how it stains the wood slightly, which of course doesn't matter for propeller making in the least. In fact, we want to see the glue lines. But there was some talk of possibly getting a dry joint if one applied glue to only one side only. So I'm going to put glue on here and then I'm going to put glue on the corresponding face of the next plank that goes downwards. So it's actually glue on glue rather than one layer of glue and wood. I didn't spot any evidence of dry joints on my last propeller, but I think in the light of that knowledge, it wasn't a bad idea. It'll use a little more glue. It means it'll leak a bit more out the sides but that doesn't matter at all. The other thing I've done, I've moved the blocks in. So I've basically got a block at one third and a block at two thirds. I've got 12 clamps. So I've got eight clamps already set up so they can be slid along very quickly and just tightened up without actually having to do any nuts up. And then the four center clamps are all prepared like so. So I merely have to slide one stud up, put the clamp in place, slide the stud back down through the hole and put one nut on with a washer and then tighten them up. So hopefully that'll expedite the clamping process once all the gluing's done.
The corners are just drilled ready for the, the nails that keep the planks roughly aligned. Of course, if they're aligned fairly roughly at the ends, then it means the centre is pretty good um, where the hub is. So I best get gluing. There we are, trussed up tighter than a nun's knickers, and drippier than an ice cream parlour during a power cut. Next time we'll cut the blank to shape and then look at drawings, marking out the blank and how to determine pitch and lots of other exciting stuff. As always, thanks for watching.